If he could have kept that one memory and erased all the others, he might have become a different Gerald Mannion. But allowing one forced him to run the gauntlet of them all. It did not matter that the first blow fell as a kiss. He was six years old when the hand struck out of darkness. Dressed in blue pajamas with cowboys riding bucking broncos and twirling lassos. From the flickering television came bouncy cartoon songs. There ought to have been warning music when the flat palm drew back. Special sound effects when it struck. Boing. And his head shot out like the ball at the end of a tether before bouncing back into place. The first warning came from his mother. Shut off the fucking TV and go to bed. I don't want to, he snapped back. No. On his knees up close to the set, his eyes crusty with dried tears. You can't make me. Gerald, I told you, he pleaded, meaning his argument before that he was afraid to be alone in his bed, even with the light on. When he lay in his bed, skeleton hands grabbed for his ankles. These hands could turn invisible, so no amount of his mother's searching disclosed them. No amount of explaining convinced her. She used to give in sometimes, but no longer, now that she had her new man, Jerry, the big one with the bushy beard and eyebrows, the thick carpet of graying hair across his back. Mannion secretly called him Grizzly Man. She and Jerry lay together in the bedroom he'd been banished from. Earlier, he'd spied on them through the narrow slit in the doorway. They took turns being the bronc, then the rider. Jerry rode a motorcycle and went away for days at a time while she stumbled around, making up for all she did not do when he was there, the cleaning and the washing and the cooking. Her eyes were always funny now, gray circles, the pupils small, and when she put on her bikini to lie in the sun, he counted the ribs between the two pieces of suit. They didn't stay in the bedroom all the time. They wanted to take over the living room and the kitchen too, so he had to be put out of the way. He'd come out on other nights and caught them sitting together on a single kitchen chair, his mother backwards on Jerry's lap, facing him, lolling side to side, up and down. One time, with languid movement, her head resting on one brillo pad shoulder, rose up, and her meandering gaze found him. Her eyes looked milky and swollen, and her mouth hung open in a silent O, her cheeks seeming to cave in on themselves. She looked at her son as if, she, as if he puzzled rather than angered her as if she wasn't sure who he was. Boy, his butt resting on his heels, he turned to see the arms sweep through the air, thinking of an airplane he'd watched landing when his mother took him to Bangor, coming in so straight and true, and then the impact. Closing his eyes, he imagined his boy body lifting off the floor and flying across the room, and he ended up on his side, his face hot and stinging, his ears plugged as if underwater, while this big wild bear of a man hovered over him, and again he imagined a cartoon image, the villain so big he blocked the sun. Turn off the fucking TV like your mother told you and get your ass to bed. He turned and took two giant steps away, making the whole trailer rattle. When he stopped and twisted back, his eyes should have been balls of fire. You don't want me coming back out here again. Cocooned within the blankets wrapped tightest around his vulnerable feet, Gerald curled up in a ball, poised to scream the moment those invisible hands grabbed his body and tugged. Panting, he heard them take over the living room, the big bear man laughing, his big bear laugh. The television went quiet, then burst on again with loud, strange music that made the walls vibrate until the volume lowered. They were watching one of Jerry's videos. He'd seen one once when they left it in the machine. It was full of twangy music and people without clothes. He smelled the smoke that helped his mother sleep, wondered if there was enough of it in the air. It might help him sleep, too. That was in the summer. She met most of her men in spring. They moved in for the summer, packed up and left before winter. A love life on the cycle of nature. There was one good one, Professor Ken. Wire-rimmed glasses, long hair to his shoulders, parted in the middle. Not stringy like some of the others, but neat and soft. He would tuck it back behind his ears, just like his mother did with hers, and then look down, and it would all flop back into his face again. He was a college professor from Massachusetts, doing research in the local library for a book he was writing. How they met was a mystery, even to his mother, who'd sit beside him on the couch sometimes and tuck back his hair for him and ask, how did you and I ever get together like this? Ken only laughed and kissed her. He took them out to dinner, both of them to a seafood restaurant where Mannion ate lobster for the first time. 
He played catch with Mannion in the front yard, dropped his mother at the beauty parlor, and took Mannion for walks along the river. He never moved in, but when he showed up, they'd eat dinner together, his mother cooking, and they'd watch TV, and then Mannion went off to bed, and in the morning his mother's door would be wide open and welcoming, and he'd peek in to see her lying on her side, her back to Professor Ken, whose arms encircled her, as if she fit naturally into the slot of him. They drank wine at dinner, and he sometimes found two empty bottles on the counter by the sink when he went out in the morning. She'd sworn off everything else that summer, except the cigarettes she smoked all the time. He never asked if Ken could stay. He knew the cycles of his mother's nature. But shouldn't there have been a different cycle with the nature of the man so different? If the bad ones all left in autumn, shouldn't the good ones stay through the winter just for variety's sake? No, the variety here was how he didn't even wait for autumn. And all through September, his mother, who usually cursed and broke things when men left her, cried. One night he woke to banging. His sleep-clouded mind believed a bear was attacking the trailer. He leapt from bed and ran into the hallway. The noise came from his mother's room, a crack of flesh, a thud, something breaking. Fucking bitch, a man snarled. Fucking cunt. When flesh struck flesh, how could one seem so much harder? A man appeared in the entrance to his mother's bedroom. Mannion saw a balding head and bristly face, the red and white checks of a plaid shirt. Heard an unfamiliar voice, get out of my way, you little shit. Then a tornado hit him and hurled him back against the wall. The back of his head cracked. Through blurry eyes, he saw the man's plaid shirt stop at the front door. He bent forward and thrust one foot into the work boot he held in both hands. He pulled on the other, grabbed his jacket, and stormed outside, not bothering to tie the laces. Mannion dragged himself to his knees. A tender egg swelled in the back of his head. Although the man had slammed the door, the latch didn't catch, and now it swung open and closed, open and closed, while the wind blew a powdery snow inside. Outside, a car engine tried to turn over. Thirteen years old, he imagined lying in wait as the man returned, smashing his kneecaps with a baseball bat, battering his bald head until it shattered. But inside he was five again, and he muttered a prayer as the engine cranked, Please start. And the answer, the engine turned over. A heavy foot revved the gas. The car squeaked, its tires scrunching packed snow, and headlights sliced through the kitchen window. Mannion hurled himself against the door and slammed the bolt. His sock-covered feet stepped in snow that felt like needles. When he dared draw back the curtain and peek outside, the car was gone. His mother knelt in the corner, twisted into it as if being punished. He looked for a robe or towel to cover her nakedness. Her body quivered and a hissing, bubbly breath squeezed out of her. When he brought the towel toward her shoulders, she flinched and jerked, a startled cry popping out. It's all right, he whispered. He's gone. Blood trickled down one arm. More of it stuck to the wall, spots thick like phlegm. Ma, he whispered, arranging the towel again, angry at himself for grabbing something so coarse when a blanket would have been softer. But she let him lay the towel over her like a shawl. She would not grab it, her arms pressed close to her side, her hands covering her face. Her legs were bent at an angle so awkward he feared she might be crippled. Here, Ma, I'll get a blanket. When he let go, the towel fluttered to the floor. He managed to coax, to coax the softer blanket all the way around her. It stretched behind like a queen's cape. Suddenly, she burst into tears as if the blanket had caused it. Her cries were loud and bubbly, her shoulders shaking. While he stood helplessly, his mind seeking names of people who might help him purchase a gun, teach him how to fire. How much money could he come up with? He'd taken things from the McCrory store in town, but could he lift enough to earn money for a gun? How would he find the man? He imagined he'd already done the hard stuff and now stood over the man, not his mother cowering in the corner. Who's the little shit now, he demanded. The room had grown quiet. His mother stirred, tentatively lifting her head. Her lip had burst like the tender flesh of a grape. There was a puffiness in one cheek, a bruise already forming around one eye. Could you get me some ice, she managed, her voice a raspy, thick whisper, her face flinching with every word. The next winter, he brought no men, she brought no men home. This should have made him happy, but she took to her bed before the light began to fade and stayed there drinking and smoking, 
for a drug, the new color TV she recently bought, even though she lost her job in September. All year he'd been attending school regularly because he liked Mr. Worthington, the new social studies teacher, who was sarcastic and rebellious and straight talking, and who had, for some crazy reason, taken a liking to short, pudgy young Gerald Mannion. Get me a new pack of cigs, will you? She asked when he came in during a break from doing homework. A game show was on TV, three people standing in a line asking about letters in the alphabet. A tall glass, one-third full of amber liquid, no ice, sat at her bedside. He'd noticed when she didn't put ice in her drink, he had more trouble waking her in the morning. After he delivered the cigarettes, she patted the bed. Sit with me a while, she said. She wore a flannel nightgown with a sweatshirt over that and thick pink socks. She pushed herself up farther in bed and patted the mattress again. Come sit with your mom and watch. He hadn't changed from his school clothes yet. He slipped off his loafers and climbed in. He kept space between them until she leaned over and drew his body close. My little man, she said, which made him think of all her other men, Ken and Grizzly Man and Plaid Shirt and Beater. The show had too much stupid talking and the prizes were cheap. She looked at the puzzle, four words with most of the letters blanked, and made up his own answer. Fuck this stupid show. <laughs> he felt a twang of disappointment when they uncovered a letter that proved the puzzle couldn't say that. He smelled her burning cigarette. She had scrunched down and laid the ashtray on her belly. How was school today, she asked when the commercial came on. Okay. You still like that teacher? What's his name, Mr. What the Fuck? <laughs> Mr. Worthington, he said, trying to sound matter-of-fact. He had tried not to make too much of Mr. Worthington, partly because he didn't believe, even five months into the school year, that he wouldn't eventually turn into all the other teachers he'd known who hated him because he wasn't what they wanted him to be. But he was also afraid she might take an interest in Mr. Worthington. He didn't want Mr. Worthington to become her next man. Sometimes he thought he might have liked that, riding to school with Mr. Worthington. He'd have tried extra hard on his homework, knowing Mr. Worthington was sleeping across the hall. 